Hi everybody, I'm Ken Curtis, owner of Reef Seekers Dive Company, and in my capacity as chairman of Chamber Day, I've had plenty of opportunities to go out to Catalina and visit the USC Catalina Hyperbaric Chamber, and we thought maybe you'd like to do the same thing, we being Chamber Director Carl Huggins and myself. So we put together this little video, and at the end of it, we'll also tell you how you can arrange an actual in-person visit for yourself. But be aware, a lot of people think the chamber's in Avalon. It is not. It's up at the Isthmus area, the Two Harbors area, which is more or less the middle of the island. So that's where you'll have to be going. But as of right now, I've got Carl standing by out on the island. And uh, Carl, that's the actual chamber that you're standing in front of, is it not? Uh, yes, this is the chamber. And that's about, it's about how long? What's the size uh, there? It's about 25 foot long and it's about nine foot in diameter. And uh, the chamber was actually, it was donated uh, uh, to, to us um, a number of years ago, right? Uh, yes, back in the late 60s when uh, USC received land from the Wrigley family, they put up a marine lab here at the facility and there was a lot of diving that went on during that time. In the early 70s, one of the research divers that was diving from the facility ended up with decompression sickness for the bends. And at that time, the only chambers around were military and commercial chambers. And they eventually found a place to treat the diver, but it drove home the need to have something at our facility here on Catalina. And Lockheed had this chamber. They weren't using it anymore. And so it was donated to USC and brought over here to support the divers and diving research at the facility. And we've actually got uh, some, some old slides here that uh, we've got up right now. Uh, so it actually, it came in on a barge and then uh, got rolled up on those railroad tracks. Uh, that's correct. The, the tracks were actually for a submersible uh, that had been tested out here by the Navy. And the hangar was actually built by the Navy. And, then, and when you say the hangar, that's, uh, that's the building that right. the, uh, the chamber is in. And really, uh, other than other support stuff in there, that is the sole function of that hangar, right? Correct, we have some storage, but the main purpose of the hangar is the chamber operations. Well, speaking of operations, uh, that's the point of this. And, and we have a couple of places that we want to uh, stop along our tour. So why don't you head on over to the recorder place? That's where we'll uh, begin our tour and uh, we'll start there. All right. While Carl repositions himself, let me give you an idea of what we're gonna be showing you. He's gonna start at the recorder station, then we'll move over to the actual chamber operator, show you where some of the air bank controls are, the supervisor area, then we'll take you inside the actual chamber. It's a multi-lock chamber, so we'll start in the outer lock and then go inside where the actual treatments occur. But I can see that Carl is now in position at our, our first stop, which is the recorder station, right, Carl? Correct, uh, we have three positions that our volunteer crew members run when they're here. We've got the recorder, we've got the operator, we have an inside tender, and then we have a supervisor that oversees them. So for people who hated the idea of dive tables, that looks an awful lot like a dive table I'm seeing on that whiteboard right there. Well, this is actually a treatment protocol. And so once we get permission from a physician to treat the diver, we'll put the treatment protocol on the board here and then the recorder will go through and time each of these segments tell the operator when the chamber needs to move where it needs to move to and tell the tender when the gas switches need to occur for the patient and just to be clear carl when you say to tell the chamber where to move the move the, or tell the operator where to move the chamber we're not really moving the chamber you're talking about moving depth wise we're going to be right. shallower right. deeper whatever yeah. Pressurizing the chamber, yeah. I, I don't want people to think we're moving the chamber every now and then. You've got well, a bunch of people ask if the tracks are so we can send it down into the water to various steps. Well, that would actually be convenient, you know, <laughs> probably a little impractical. You've got uh, a bunch of timers there, it looks like. What, what are the timers for? The timers are to record the various events, the descents, the ascents, the time that the patient is breathing oxygen, the time that the patient is breathing air, and also if we're locking in a physician or sending a physician in to examine the patient, we've got lock clocks to keep track of their dive so we can run the tables for the doctors so they can move in and out of the chamber during a treatment. So, so basically the recorder is, it's sort of like a, a very important administrative role, but they could be tracking three or four different people. In other words, you could have the tender, the patient and the doctor all on different decompression 
schedules, and that's something that that reporter has to keep track of. The patient and the tender are the easy ones. There's a set protocol for that. The doctor, the number of times they lock in, you have to calculate repetitive dives and run their schedules like you would run a normal dive if you're running tables, because we do not use computers here to calculate the compression status. And you're just using uh, Navy tables pretty much? Uh, they're a more conservative set of tables. Well, let's, uh, let's move a little bit over uh, to, to screen right, but your left, and we can talk a little bit about the actual uh, chamber operator position, which is really just on the other side of the uh, recorder position. This is the position that drives the chamber. So we let air in to pressurize the chamber, and then we release air to remove the pressure from inside the chamber. And that's how we simulate increasing depth and decreasing depth in the chamber against this calibrated gauge. Yeah, I was gonna say you have a, a huge gauge uh, there and that would indicate what depth the chamber is at. Now you, you also, at uh, the Catalina Hyperbaric Chamber, you'll take people down to 165 feet, is that correct? For air embolism cases, we will start our treatment at 165 feet and at uh, 60 feet for decompression sickness cases. And, and am I right in thinking that uh, the, the Catalina chamber is one of the few chambers around that still will uh, go down to 165? So we're one of the few that will still treat at 165. There's some chambers that will go deeper, but most facilities start treatment at 60 feet or just a little less than three atmospheres. So Carl, if we're talking about getting air and stuff into the chamber, let's take them over to the banks and the valves where all that happens. All right. Carl's only got to move a few feet, but it gives us a chance to reposition the camera as well. And he will end up in front of a bank of levers and knobs and dials and stuff. And Carl, that's an amazing array uh, that you have there in front of you. So this is the control panel for the gases that the patient will breathe inside. We can either have them breathe pure oxygen 50-50 nitrox, or in case of an emergency, we have our emergency air. And so we can select which of these go inside to the masks for the patient to breathe. Yeah, and we'll, we'll show everybody the inside in just a little bit. Obviously, the way to get that air in, you've got a couple of compressors there. So I would assume having multiple compressors is sort of a key thing to make sure the chamber can be operational. Because obviously, if one of those, if they, if they all go down, we, we got a problem, so, uh, and that was, as I recall, wasn't that an issue a couple of years ago that we, we needed to replace one of those compressors? We needed to replace the high pressure compressor a few years back, and then this past year we had to do a full overhaul on our low pressure compressor. So we've got a recorder and an operator, and I guess the operator can also run those banks, but we need someone to sort of oversee everything, and that would be our supervisor, so why don't we move up there now? All right, come on up. So Carl, I see you're up at the uh, supervisor area now, and that's a bigger area than what we've been in before. What, what do we have up here? So this is sort of the communications hub of the operation. The supervisor is up here. When our physician arrives, the physician is here. And then we've got our phones that we communicate to the mainland. We've got our radios that we use to talk to the dive boat and Baywatch. And the supervisor will also be monitoring the gases going into the chamber throughout the treatment. And there's two mannequin heads sitting there on the shelf. What's up with those? So these are used for demonstration purposes. This one has been, this one's a normal size head, and this one's been down to 165 feet or six atmospheres uh, to show how the cells compress in the styrofoam. I was gonna say, cause styrofoam's actually got air inside. So when you take them down to 165, that's, that's why the, the heads yeah. get smaller. So therefore, it makes you an actual head shrinker. That's correct. Let's, uh, let's take them inside the thing that shrinks those heads uh, down like that. And let's go ahead and go, go inside the outer lock of the chamber. All right. Well, even though Carl only has to walk a few feet again, this time he's got to take his shoes off. And that's so you don't track dirt, debris, contamination uh, into the chamber. Our chamber is what we call a multi-lock chamber. The inner lock is where all the actual treatment goes on if someone is bent or embolized. But Carl is starting off in the outer lock. And Carl, what is the purpose of the outer lock? So yeah, the outer lock is basically a pressure elevator. So we're at sea level on the outside. We're treating a patient at 60 feet on the inside. The doctor wants to examine the patient. We'll put him in the lock here. 
close the door, increase the pressure in the outer lock until it equals the pressure inside so that the physician can go in and examine the patient without losing any pressure in the inner chamber. And, and I can't help but notice on the right side of our screen there, something that I guess in polite company would be called a necessity. What, what, what is it you got there? So some of our treatments can last quite a while, but we do have our facilities here, or what I like to call our chamber pot. Uh, Carl, why don't we go uh, inside to the uh, main part of the chamber and uh, we'll show them where the treatments actually take place. All right, come on in. And this is the interlock, which is where we treat our patients. We have two bunks set up and can accommodate more if need be. What's the, what's the most you've ever uh, treated in there? Uh, before my time, it was four treated at once. Since I've been here, we've treated three at one time. A lot of, a lot of people get underscores why you need to have a lot of volunteers, uh, volunteers as well. Plus a large chamber helps with that also. So Carl, I, uh, I see we have uh, a bunch of hoses there with a mask hanging off it. I'm guessing that is key to treatment. Uh, yes, when we pressurize the chamber, we pressurize with air but we're treating the patient with either oxygen or 50-50 nitrox. And in order to deliver that, we have our masks that are hooked up to the gas supply from outside. And we have the high oxygen gas coming in that they'll breathe off of. And when they exhale, it exhausts through an exhaust hose and gets dumped overboard. So we do not build up the pressure, the partial pressure of oxygen inside the chamber. And I would assume, Carl, that's to lessen the risk of fire, because obviously in, in a contained environment like inside the chamber, a, a fire is not something uh, you want to have to deal with. Uh, that is correct. We want to keep the oxygen level in the chamber as low as possible in order to reduce the risk of fire. And we limit the amount of materials brought in and open electronics so we don't have a risk of a fire starting inside. And you do have a fire suppression system inside the chamber, right? That is correct. We have a fire suppression system that we can activate from either inside or outside. And luckily, over the years, we've never had a fire inside this chamber. And we will keep our fingers crossed that that uh, continues well into, the, uh, well into the future. So hopefully, Carl, we're showing people there's an awful lot uh, involved in, in a treatment. And, uh, you know, it's not just a question, well, I got bent, I'll go to the chamber and no big deal. A lot of people involved, a lot of time involved. And again, you said you're going to spend anywhere from four to maybe as much as eight hours uh, in there on, on a treatment. So uh, I, I would assume there's, and it's limited comfort, I would guess, as well. Yes. Our tenders stay in the entire time. Our crew may rotate outside, but we have a volunteer who's in here committed to that treatment, and they stay in with the patient the entire time. Plus, we have the coordination with the paramedics and LA County USC Medical Center uh, that we work with. And so it requires a lot of moving parts to come together to treat somebody. So Carl, hopefully we, we've shown people there's an awful lot that goes into a, a chamber treatment, a lot of people involved, a lot of time and effort. And we've given them obviously a very, a very limited view uh, here in this video. But if uh, they've got a group or something, is it, is it possible for people to come out and get an actual tour of the chamber? Uh, absolutely. Part of our mission is outreach and education. So anybody who wants to sign up for a tour or arrange a tour out at our facility, uh, just contact us. Uh, chamber at usc.edu is our email address and we can arrange for a tour. Very good. Well, uh, I, I think it'd be fair to say we're happy to see you uh, socially. We'd rather not see you professionally, but we will uh, we will be there uh, if need be. As Carl, I, I, Carl, I think you said I'll, I'll be stealing your lines. We'd rather see you coming in this way than this way, but we'll uh, we'll be there to help no matter which way you come in. Absolutely. Well, we hope you've enjoyed your video virtual visit to the USC Catalina Hyperbaric Chamber. It really is a pretty incredible place, and I hope you do get a chance to go out there and visit in person sometime because our chamber does absolutely provide a very valuable safety net for those of us who dive here in Southern California. I'm Ken Curtis and on behalf of Carl Huggins and myself, thanks so much for watching.